place of worship this morning at Faith Presbyterian Church. We want to welcome you, especially if you're a visitor, and uh, invite you to fill out a visitor card that you can see in the pews in front of you. There's also a guest book just outside the back door. And we also have um, opportunities for people to uh, stay for lunch and, and so forth. So please read the bulletin and, and check that out if you are visiting with us. Um, you'll also see an, a number of announcements. I'm not gonna highlight all of those. Um, there's just a few that um, are uh, coming up soon. The harvest dinner, ha there's an announcement about that. Um, there's one for the annual reformation service if you attend that service, you know that it's very full. That's one, one challenge. The second one is parking is really tricky. There's not a lot of parking in, around in the area and we're, we're securing some extra parking areas to try to make that work better. Um, one other way that you can help is to park as far away as you can still you know, safely walk so that our visitors have an easier time parking. People like us, we kind of know the side streets, we know where a lot of the empty spots are, but people that are driving from other churches don't know all those secrets. So if we leave some of the easy spots for them, uh, that helps them out when they get here. So kind of be looking around. Um, there will be some signs that also show where these overflow parking lots are. Um, we're looking at um, parking at the diner across the, the street. Um, and then there's an office building um, across the street the other way that we're trying to get parking for too. And so there will be announcements about that next Sunday morning. But just want to give you a heads up that if we can park further away, it helps people that are visiting be able to park closer. Um, you may have also gotten an email. Um, we want to extend our prayers and sympathy to Travis and Gail Lee. Um, they had a mis miscarriage recently and just uh, to extend our our thoughts to them and to be praying for them. I would also um, like to invite Stefan to come up to give the missions report now at this time. Good morning. I do apologize if I go into a cough attack. I've been dealing with <clears throat> a case of bronchitis. You know, I like to think that I know what God is doing in my life. I like to look at my circumstances, both good and bad, mostly good, mostly good, and say to myself, maybe God is trying to teach me this, or maybe God is preparing me for that. But the reality is, is that as much as I want to read between the lines of my life and decipher what God is doing with me, I really don't know what the potter has in mind for the clay. And I can tell you that I certainly didn't know all that God was doing with me all those years ago when he gave me new life in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of what Jesus said to Nicodemus on that night when Nicodemus went out to see him. He said, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This morning I want to share with you <clears throat> how the Spirit of God has been coming and going in the hearts of the people of Lviv, Ukraine, and how he has been bringing his Ukrainian people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ through the faithful work of our missionary there named Hero Hackboard. And one of the people that God has been working in is a young woman <clears throat> named Ernia. And when Ernia was in the ninth grade, she heard that Hero was holding a summer English camp up in the Carpathian Mountains, where she could learn and practice her English language skills. And you see, in Ukraine, English language instruction is a scarce commodity, sought after by high school students, college students, and even older adults as well. So, so great is the demand that young Ukrainians don't mind hearing about Jesus as long as they get to learn English. But Ernia didn't know that God would teach her more than just English that summer. 
but that he would also teach her an entirely different language altogether. And it was there in that summer in the Carpathian Mountains that Ernia learned the language of the gospel spoken to her by Jesus Christ. She heard her Savior, and she gladly followed. That was all the way back in 2008. In 2009, she would meet her now husband, Volodymyr, who was attending his first English summer camp with Hero Hackboard. And that summer, he too learned the language of the gospel. He also heard his Savior and gladly followed. Today, Ernia and Volodymyr are happily married and are vital, instrumental members of the church there in Lviv, Ukraine. Ernia and Volodymyr are just two of the many people that God has been working in through Hero's summer English camps. This year marks the 11th year that Hero has held these summer English camps. Earlier this summer, they received about 60 young people in attendance. And out of the 60, roughly 20 of them have been regularly attending the church's weekly Bible studies. And so we pray that as they learn more and more about Jesus, that they too would hear his voice and follow him. Not only is God working through these summer English camps, he has also been working through a publishing house that Hero has recently established. And through this publishing house, Hero has been able to publish reformed educational materials, such as Sunday school curriculums for young children, adult Bible study guides, daily devotionals, and church training materials, all in the Ukrainian language. And recently, Hero has just published the church's first reformed Ukrainian hymnal. And these publishing materials have been essential to the edification of the church members there in Lviv, Ukraine. So much so that a few months ago, the church has received eight additional members simply because of the educational materials that they received and studied on their own. In addition, the church has begun remodeling a small home and land that they purchased two years ago into an office and conference center where they plan to permanently meet until they can acquire the funds and labor to finally begin the building of a larger chapel on that land. The Spirit of God is certainly coming and going in Lviv, Ukraine. And Hero is patiently waiting for God to answer some of his most fervent prayers, prayers that you and I could also fervently pray, even though we are nowhere near Lviv. First, you can pray that the youth ministry leaders and volunteers are able to follow up with follow up one-on-one -on -one with all the people that have attended their Bible studies in summer English camps. And this is particularly a difficult task because many of the people that come to Bible study in these English camps live very far away, sometimes even three hours away from Lviv. Second, you can also pray that God will raise up men in the church to be elders and deacons. And this has been one of Hero's prayers for the last 11 years and is still waiting for God to appoint elders and deacons among their new church members. And then lastly, you can pray for Hero and his family, his wife and his children, that he receive strength and persistence to continually do God's work in Lviv, Ukraine. Thanks, Stephen. Um, let's rise for the call to worship. It comes to us this morning from Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Let's pray. Lord, the heavens, Lord of the heavens and the earth, what do we have to offer the one who has created all things? What can we offer of value to you, O Lord? We offer our need. We offer a humble and contrite heart. Would you stoop to our need? Would you receive the worship we offer because we offer it in thanks and in joy for what you have done? Fill us 
Move us to meditate upon you and praise you with our whole being and not just a shallow thought or empty words. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's sing together from the bulletin. You'll see there are two songs here that we'll sing right in a row.
Please be seated. Now let's take out the Red Trinity hymnals and turn to page 792. 792 has a responsive reading of Psalm 25. The psalmist is in prayer to the Lord for help, for forgiveness, and for, for guidance to give him guidance in his life. Let's read this responsively. Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. But they will be put to shame, Lord, for our treasures and God's excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. And let's read this together. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Now the choir will bring the anthem.
Junior Church is dismissed at this time too. Let's bow our heads in prayer together. Father, we thank you that we can hear your praises being sung and being reminded of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your commands in scripture and your teaching. How good it is to know that you hear us when we pray. Just to, just to compare the idols of this world, the things that we, we chase after. What, what pagan god, what earthly treasure would we hope to hear our prayers? Would we consider bowing down to our bosses, our, uh, the, the idols in our society? Would we consider bowing down to our bank accounts for help? Would we, would we pray and expect them to hear us? Would we pray to the fashion industry or to looking just right and hoping that could somehow hear our prayer? Would we, would we call out to some universe that we, we never have received a word from? Would, would that help us? Would we consider that any of those things could hear our prayer? But in your word, Lord, we see you hear the Israelites. We hear you hear Elijah pray for fire from heaven. We hear Hannah ask for a, for a child. Solomon ask for wisdom. Our Lord Jesus Christ called upon your name for help. Will you not hear us when we call out? Lord, what would we expect our earthly idols to do for us? Would we expect them to be able to heal us when we're sick? To comfort us when we're grieving? Is there a narcotic, Lord, that we would pray to? Certainly not. You are our strength. You are our shield. So, Lord, it is to you that we praise, it is to you that we worship and adore, and it's you we ask for help. Would you give us faith to trust you, Lord? Would you give us faith and hope to persevere each day? Lord, would you comfort us? Would you provide our daily food, Lord? Would you give us work to do each day to, to sustain our lives? Lord, would you give us minds to learn our schoolwork? We pray to you who hears. We pray to you who has power, who has strength, who has conquered all of his enemies. Lord, we ask you, would you give us wisdom? Wisdom to do our jobs, wisdom to be parents, wisdom to, to teach. Lord, would you give us love for our family members? Would you give us love for our spouses? We ask, Lord, to you that you would give us safety from harm and protection. Lord, we ask you that you would give us your spirit. Your word tells us that you will give it. Would you give us your spirit that we would fight temptation that they would not overwhelm us. We ask you, Lord, would you forgive our sins? Would you help us to reach out to this world, Lord, to spread your fame, to speak of the power and the, the glory of our God? Lord, would you cause this dark world to see your glorious light, to see the glory of your kingdom? Father, would you give us boldness to proclaim your salvation? Would you bless us, Lord? Would you bless 
our pastors and missionaries? Would you bless the outreach in the Ukraine that those who have gone to the English classes and camps would, would hear your word and would, would, that, that, that your word would fall upon soil that is rich and ready to grow the seed of the gospel. Lord, we pray that our Bible studies would be places that flourish because we're reading your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us in our, our small groups, in our adult Sunday school, in our high school and, and um, elementary school, and even uh, the beginner's class for, for Sunday school, Lord. Would you richly bless that, and would you be preparing our hearts Lord, would you reach into the hearts of those who do not know you, those are, who are our loved ones, our coworkers that we've been praying for on, on a daily basis. Lord, would you work in their hearts? Lord, would you even rule over the rulers of this world, those who would make laws, those who would command armies, those who would have power. Lord, would you rule over them? And Lord, would you give your peace, peace that this world does not know? Lord, we pray in faith. All of these, all these requests, Lord, we pray to you because if you have not even spared your own son for us, would you not do all things for our salvation. Would you not do all things for the good of your people? We plead, Lord, that you would because you are a good God. You are faithful. You are our God. And to you be glory forever and ever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'll ask the ushers to please take the offering. Now let's rise to sing number 605. We'll sing all three verses, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, 605.
morning. Well, if you would open your Bibles with me, uh, if you turn with me uh, to the book of Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 24. We continue uh, in our morning series on a praying life. We've been looking at um, we've been looking at various um, aspects of what it means to have a life of prayer. Uh, we looked at uh, praying in God's name and what that means and how to do that. Uh, we've looked at the essence of prayer. Um, you know what what really is prayer. And, and then how to pray, um, uh, how to pray for uh, understanding, and how to pray for the lost, and particularly how to pray for our enemies. And this week, we look at, at how to pray for guidance, right? Uh, we're looking at how to pray for God's help in guiding us in our lives. Well, before we, we hear God's word, let's Let's uh, go to the Lord uh, for guidance in terms of our hearing. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning asking for your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, to work in our lives, to give us ears to hear, to open the eyes of our hearts that we might behold the, the wondrous and glorious truth of your word that speaks to us of Jesus Christ and of your grace in him. Lord, would you bless your people as they hear, and would you bless me as I proclaim and, and read and proclaim your word, that you would indeed lead us and guide us through this endeavor. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, hear now uh, the reading of God's holy word, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 24. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and, and God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell." but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today. And show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels, let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Throughout history, uh, people have always struggled with what to do next. We've always struggled with asking God for guidance. Right? We don't know the future. We don't know what, what we should do. And so we always ask, we're always in need of, of how to go. Some people 
unbelievers may flip a coin to decide which way they should go, uh, kind of like, a, uh, like the coin toss at a football game. Uh, some people look for some sign, uh, whatever that might be, an, a, a providential sign, a circumstantial sign, or maybe even a supernatural sign from God in the way that they should go. And in the Bible, we see something like this through the casting of lots, you know, kind of like the rolling of dice, you know, whatever the number is, that's the steps they should go, or you see this throughout the Old Testament. Um, in battle, um, you know, Joshua would, would cast the, the uh, lots, and, and then and, uh, and they would, he would split up his armies in battle, and, and the, Lord, the Lord answered uh, him according to, uh, in that way. There were the priests who would use the, uh, the, the Urim and the Thummim. And we're not completely sure what, what that is. It might be something like the casting of, of lots, but maybe with a little bit more specificity, where it was easier for the priest to discern uh, in more specific ways the way that, that God's people should go and, and to understand God's will particularly. But then there was the more primary way that God spoke in the giving of his word and through his prophets who, who, who had the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, to use the prophets to speak directly to God's people, to guide them in the way that they should go, to call them to repentance and return uh, to the Lord when they were straying like lost sheep. But now, in the New Testament era, all of those Old Testament ways uh, of casting lots, of the Urim and the Thummim, uh, the, the supernatural signs that, that people asked for, you know, we think of Gideon, right? If the fleece is wet and the grass is dry, and then the next day, well, if the grass is wet and, and the fleece is dry, um, you know, then I'll do uh, what you want me to do. And... But in the New Testament era, God gives the fullness, the fullness of his revelation and of his will and his ways to us in the giving of his, his last and final word that comes to us in Jesus Christ and the giving of the Holy Spirit that indwells in us and leads us in the ways that we ought to go. And all of that is, is summarized by the writer of Hebrews in, in, in Hebrews chapter 1. He says, long ago and at many times in many ways... Right? God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, in this New Testament era, uh, between the first and second coming of Jesus, God has spoken to us by His Son. Uh, and, and all of that that's associated with it, particularly uh, in the, the closing of the canon and in the fullness of the Old and New Testaments, that that, that is sufficient for all of faith and life and godliness, including the everyday guidance that God wants us uh, to have um, as a combination of, of knowing God's will and of prayer to understand God's will um, through the everyday interactions of our lives. And so that makes us ask then, you know, uh, why don't, you know, if we don't cast lots anymore, if we don't uh, do, if we don't roll the dice, if you will, if we don't have the Urim and the Thummim anymore, if we don't have miraculous signs and prophets to speak to us the way that they did in the Old Testament, how do we discern God's will? How do we ask God for guidance when we need to make a choice between A and B, to go through the left door, or the right door, or the left way, or the right way? Or, uh, you know, what to do in terms of our jobs, you know, uh, whether this person is the right person to ask out on a date and maybe think about the future in which we, there's the possibility of getting married or how many children should we have? Uh, uh, which, should I take this job as opposed to that job? You know, which house should I buy? All of these things are, are, are questions of how, how do we ask God, how do we pray to God for guidance. And that's what I want us to look at this, this, this morning, that a praying life is a life of prayer to ask God to guide us in everything that we do. So let's look at, at how Eliezer, the servant that, 
that Abraham uh, commands and Abraham prays in verses 12, to, uh, I mean, uh, Eliezer prays in verses 12 to 14 as a model for how to pray for God's guidance. It's a blueprint of how we ought to pray as New Testament Christians uh, for God to guide us. Um, and so let's look at what that means. Let's look at what that, what that looks like. First, we need to already be walking in God's will and God's ways. Um, in other words, before we even pray, it's important to, have, to already have a relationship in which God already guides us, right? Um, it, it's important to, to, that the context of our prayers uh, arises out of a life in which we desire to follow the Lord. Because if we don't, we wouldn't even ask for God, ask for God's help, right? If we're, if we're lost sheep and we're going our way and we, we don't care uh, which way we're going, why would we ask God for guidance, right? Unless we're ready to hear it. So we need to already be in, walking in and with God according to His will, uh, to walk with Him and to, to know Him and to follow Him. It's all... It is all uh, working together. You know, why, if you think about it, you know, why would, you know, if we're doing something against God's will, right, and we ask for, for God's guidance in a particular thing, why would we expect God to give us guidance to continue along that road of rebellion and of sin, right? Uh, God will answer that, that prayer, but he, the way that he'll guide us is don't do that, <laughs> Return to me. Go in the straight path. Hear my voice. You're my sheep. Come follow me. Come towards me. Uh, I'm not going to help you. Uh, I'm not going to lead you in how to be a better sinner. <laughs> Let's put it that way, right? And so, um, so what does that mean? How do we walk in God's will as we, we pray for God's will? We need to walk in faith. The context of Eliezer's prayer here in verses 12 to 14 is faith in God's promises. He is Abraham's oldest and most trusted servant, a circumcised member of his household who had faith in, in, this, in the God of Abraham. That he, like Abraham, trusted in God's covenant promises and, like Abraham, believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And out of that faith in God's promise, Eliezer here acts and he prays in God's will according to his plan. See, when we trust the Lord, we will ask for the Lord for help as we walk by faith, as we walk with God, as we follow the Lord. That's when, we'll, that's when we will ask God for guidance. Prayer, particularly in this, this way of asking God for guidance, for help in the ways that we should go to give us, to, uh, to make make a decision when we have several choices, right? The ones that, um, you know, among many, you know, we, we ask God, you know, Lord, which way should I go? What should I do? How can I choose? And, um, and prayer is, is a good barometer of the state of our faith. Think of it this way. The more we trust the Lord, the more we will pray to the Lord because we, trust, we don't trust ourselves. The less we trust the Lord, the less we will pray. Because we, don't, we feel like we don't need the Lord for any guidance or help. And so I want to challenge you to consider where you stand in your prayer life and what that says about your faith. I think this is one of the reasons why faith is such an important component uh, in the Christian life. Why it is a, it, it is a means of grace because it is a means of understanding uh, where, we, where our faith is, whether it's weak or whether it's strong, whether we're desperate trusting the Lord or whether, you know, we're, we're more self-sufficient and we feel like we don't need the Lord. We also need to walk in God's will. Eliezer prays in the context here of already obeying the Lord. 
Look at, look at um, he, swore by, he swore to Abraham in the early sections of this passage, by the Lord, he, he swears by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, to find Isaac a wife from his own people. Eliezer knows how important it is in the whole scheme of God's plan and promises. He, he knows intimately God's, God's global, historical, long-term, redemptive plan through Abraham, through you, God said to Abraham. Through you shall all the nations be blessed. Through your seed will all the nations be blessed. That your descendants will outnumber the, the stars in the sky and the sand, uh, uh, the sand on the, on the seas. And so Eliezer understands that this is, this is an intimate, integral part of that plan. And so that's why he prays. He's praying for God's guidance in order to do God's will. It's very, those are so intimately connected. Because if you want to do God's will, then you will ask for God's guidance. But if you don't, you won't. When we pray for guidance, um, you know, we're asking God to do that your will be done, Lord, not mine. This is why Jesus, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the true follower, the true prayer a warrior for God's guidance in his life. Why he summarizes this whole, this whole idea and this whole concept, this whole practice of praying to God absolutely for his guidance. Why in the Garden of Gethsemane he says, not, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And if we're wandering our own way and we pray for something that we want, um, in some ways when we pray to God to, on, to, for guidance on our terms, what we're really saying is the opposite of what Jesus did. Not your will be done, but my will be done, Lord. Give me what I want, not what you want. Help me to live the life that I envision for myself, not for you, uh, for what you have for me. And, um, and that's why it's so important to, to, at the very least, trust the Lord and desire to do his will so that then you can ask for, for guidance in the right context. And, uh, and maybe, maybe some of you are, in some area of your life, you are not following the Lord. Uh, maybe there is some personal uh, desire and goal that you have for yourself that goes against the will of God, and you're praying for God to give you that, and you have no answer yet. You have no guidance. Don't be surprised. As I'd mentioned before, why would, why would God give you something that leads you away from Him? Um, and, 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 uh, and so that's some food for thought for you. You know, if you, if you, want, if you wanted, you know, um, if you want certain things for your life, you know, like a better job, uh, maybe, you know, um, and you're not trusting the Lord for for that, more money, uh, maybe a spouse, a, a girlfriend or a spouse, or, or maybe um, uh, you, you have these desires and goals for your children that you project onto them. It's not what their goals uh, may be. It's not maybe what, what they're gifted and, and able to do, but it's, what, it's the goals that we project onto our own children, and we ask God to fulfill our plans, and we shouldn't be surprised when God um, answers them differently to teach us a lesson. That, that, that prayer for guidance, I'm answering it, but not the way that you want. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at that in a, in a, in a moment. But, but, uh, but this is why Eliezer prays specifically for God to help him to find a suitable uh, spouse for Isaac, um, and not just any woman. Right? He's, in effect, asking for guidance uh, for God to do his will as he's obeying him. And, uh, and this is why God answers his prayer. And this is why God will answer our prayers. That we're asking God to make known his will in and through our lives so that God would glorify himself 
in our lives. Um, we also need to pray in accordance with God's word. In other words, we need to know who God is and what he is like in order to pray in his will. Right? God hasn't left us without a way of knowing how to pray and what to pray for. God teaches us how to speak to him because he has already spoken to us in his word. He teaches us how to speak to him because he's already spoken to us in his word. Do you see how important that is? He teaches us how to speak to him because he's spoken to us and the word, that's why the, the Bible throughout history has been understood as the grammar of prayer. Now God gives us the, the concepts, the logic, the language, um, the, the mechanics of how to pray to him because he's spoken to us. And that's what we see here. We pray with the knowledge of God's word. Right? Eliezer knows how important it is to find Isaac, a Chaldean wife, right? From his own kindred people and from, that, from his, his uh, own country. And not let Isaac marry a Canaanite wife. Right? Look at verse 6 and 7. Abraham frames Eliezer's oath in the context of God's word to him. See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven and earth, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, and he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son there. And so this is why then, in fulfillment, uh, Eliezer prays, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please grant me success and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. See, his prayer for guidance is framed in the context of God's, God's character and his revealed will uh, towards Abraham. In other words, he's saying, Lord, Lord as I do this in, in the context of your greater plan, would you help me to do it? See, it's not outside of what God has revealed in God's plan. It's within it. And that's when God gives us the, the guidance, the answers that we truly need. Um, you see, praying for guidance begins with God's word becoming for us a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God's guidance begins with his word so that when we pray, that is what guides us in our prayers. If God's word doesn't guide us, then we will be lost, not only in our prayers, but in our lives. And sometimes our prayers, the lostness of our prayers for guidance is an indi indicator of the lostness of our, our lives and of our faith. And this is why Eliezer prays for God to fulfill his word to Abraham. God's word tells us, uh, his will so that we can frame our lives and especially our prayers in the light of his bigger picture and plan. Think of it this way. It's like, it's like fighting a battle, right? We are in smaller companies and battalions, and, uh, and we have the plan, this large plan uh, from our commanders, and that as we go and execute that plan, as we do our maneuvering to fight the battle, as we're doing, we're communicating with our commanders who have the bigger picture, saying, yes, you're, you're exactly where you need to be at the moment of battle. And, and that's what praying for guidance is. It is as we are doing, uh, as we're, we're following God's greater plan, we're asking God for minor adjustments, which, are we in the right place? Are we here at the right time? Are we doing the right thing? And God, our great commander, looks down and he sees the bigger picture and he says, yes, go this way. Keep going. Keep doing what I've commanded and you will win the battle. You will help us win the whole battle. Um, and, but if we're, you know, if we're a rogue group of people, uh, a band of, of warriors, and, and we go a completely different way, you know, um, it's just, we shouldn't be surprised if there's, if there's silence as to where we are. And, and, and maybe we should listen for, for God to, to bring us back and say, you know, you need to come back and follow. Follow my plans, to follow my word, to follow my will. And, um, and that's why, 
That's what we do when we pray according to God's Word. As we play our part individually and corporately, uh, God is fulfilling His greater plan through our everyday lives, through those, those everyday decisions that, uh, that bear itself out uh, into eternity. And this is the confidence, John says uh, in 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us, and if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. In other words, as we pray according to His will, He will answer, and we can be sure that He will answer, because God will, will surely do what He wants. And finally, if we walk in His ways and pray according to His word, then we can expect God to answer our prayers. Notice that Eliezer asks God to answer his prayer as he acts in faith. And as he goes to the well, as he asks for water, as he obeys the Lord, of course he had some questions, right? What if, what if uh, the woman doesn't come with me? And Abraham says, gives him out. He says, okay, well, then your, your oath is done. But as he is there getting ready to, to execute what he thinks he needs to be done, he asks the Lord, Lord, would you, would you guide me in this plan? Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. This is what I, what I appreciate about our passage, is that Eliezer, the servant, he doesn't ask for a miraculous sign. He doesn't ask for, for, for something to drop out of the sky or, or to have this divine, you know, glory cloud over the right woman who, who is going to, to be Isaac's wife. He, he asks for something really regular. And I think that's how God's word and faith and, 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 a, and a desire to obey the Lord makes him wise in such a way that, that he acts without knowing the particulars of what God wants, but the general principles of what God wants. And he goes looking for a very kind and generous woman who, when he asks for water, she'll give him water to drink. And then she said, you know what? You know, sit here and let me also give water to your camels, right? That's an act of generosity and of kindness that, that can only come from someone who, who has been blessed in some way by the Lord. And it is that, kind, that providential uh, desire to follow God's will that's so helpful here. That when we pray, when we pray for God's guidance, sometimes, you know, it's going to be something along the lines of, Lord, um, it's going to be, Lord, w would you um, show me the way I should go by opening the door of, you know, meeting the right person who is, who is a Christian? You know, meeting somebody who I'm compatible with, and we can follow the Lord together, and we can glorify you and, and, and magnify you by expanding your kingdom and meeting a, a godly Christian woman, either at church for some of you single people, and, and, and maybe some of the, 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 um, the uh, other uh, fellowships and gatherings that we have. Um, and, and instead of going to, um, uh, instead of going to like uh, a singles bar where there's no, no, uh, no where, where, you know, you don't know if there's uh, very many uh, Christians, and then asking God, Lord, of all these women in this bar, would you choose one for me? That's just, right, that just makes no sense. Um, God can, can do things extraordinarily, but that, should, that ought not to be the rule. It shouldn't be the exception. And, uh, <laughs> and I was going to preach a whole other sermon on, on, like, how to find a wife from this passage, but I'm just giving you a little bit of, 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 of wisdom here. Um, are you praying? Are you praying according to God's word, in God's ways, and asking for God's guidance, and, um, and that God answering in just normal, providential ways. Uh, I remember asking the Lord for, for a, a godly uh, woman who, who could be my wife, and, um, and I just, it was just so ordinary the way that God answered. You know, it was a Thanksgiving it was a Thanksgiving uh, dinner, and, and they invited all of us to come, 
and help set up the tables, and it was just me and Taylor. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as I was talking to her, she, you know, demonstrated a real kindness and generosity, and, you know, she was, she was attractive, but more importantly, she was godly. She wanted to give her life to, to the Lord and to serve Him with all that is in her. And, and I was like, wow, this, this is a wonderful way for God. God is answering my prayers. Um, one, one commentator says this, Nothing is more characteristic of biblical man than a profound and pervasive conviction about the role of divine providence in everyday human affairs. It should be noted that the servant does not ask for a miraculous divine intervention or for a revelation that would designate Isaac's bride-to-be. He prays, rather, that the rational criteria of suitability that he himself determines might be in accordance with God's will and be effective. God uses, that Eliezer uses the wisdom that he had acquired in order to, to, do, to, to uh, put himself in the right place, right? To go to the watering hole where, where, the, where women, young, eligible, single women would be, and then he could, you know, try and find a wife for Isaac. And, um, and so he prays, he prays with wisdom uh, in God's providence. He prays also with hope. Notice the specificity here that he, with which he prays uh, uh, for, for God to answer. Uh, he prays as if he, he knows how it's all going to happen. Uh, I think it's because he's asking not only in faith, but in hope that God will answer him. All right? Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And then he prays with expectation. When he invokes God's covenant name, O oh Lord, God of, of my master Abraham, please grant me success. He appeals to God's absolutely sovereign, certain, immovable, and unchangeable, steadfast love to Abraham. And because God has shown his steadfast love, that, it, that, that Eleazar is certain that God will continue to... to uh, to answer prayers according to that steadfast love. And in doing that, he knows, he prays knowing and expecting with certainty that God will answer him. And here, if you look at the passage, this is, you, uh, you can see that at the very moment he prays and as soon as he's done, God answers his prayer. <laughs> look, at, look at verse, I mean, you know, it's, not in, it's not in the bulletin, but but look at verse 15 if you have your Bibles. Before he had even finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. Before he was even done praying, God presented Rebekah. And this is what we see throughout the Bible. Elijah praying uh, for a drought, praying down fire, um, and God answered. This is how the centurion prayed for Jesus to heal his paralyzed servant. He told Jesus, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. Do you see that prayer? And this is why Jesus said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, it will be opened. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. As we, as we walk in His ways, as we pray in His Word, as we, as we pray, um, as we pray according to His will, God will answer. God will answer. And this brings us back then to the heart of prayer. To be more and more conformed to the character, life, and the will of God. As we walk in His will, praying in His word, expecting Him to answer, it shapes us more and more into the likeness of God. Why? Because it shapes us more and more into people who are willing to be guided by God. 
If you ask for guidance, He gives us guidance, and it shapes us ever more into people who are guided by God. And so God answers Eliezer's prayer with Rebecca, who then ends up marrying Isaac and gives birth to Jacob. And from Jacob comes the tribes of Israel and the people of God. And the promises of God's covenant to Abraham continues from generation to generation. That Eliezer's work here is an integral, absolutely essential part of God's plan for Abraham and the gospel and for you and for me because ultimately through this marriage of Rebekah and Isaac will come the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the son of David, the Messiah, the Savior of God's people. That through Him will come Jesus who will die on the cross for our sins. Who came to walk in God's will. My work is to do the will of the Father. To follow the Lord. Praying for guidance. Whatever the answer might be. And in the darkness of Gethsemane, he asks three times, Father, if it, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And in the agony of the cross, Jesus bore our sins, our guilt and shame. He suffered, bled, and died to save us and to be our Lord and Savior. He rose again and sits at God's right hand to guide us by dwelling in us and giving us his spirit. And now we can, we can pray for guidance through his, word and his, through his Word and His Spirit as Jesus dwells in us. Guide me, O Thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this bar barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Let's, let's go to the Lord always for his guidance as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you that you guide us in our lives, that you hear our prayers. Lord, help us to, to be people who, who are guided by you, that you would shape us more and more through that praying life of guidance into people who are guided by you. Lord, if there is anyone, uh, Lord, who, who has who have questions about the way in which they should go. Uh, Lord, w th may this be an opportunity for them to, to pray to you for guidance so that, you, so that they might learn to say more and more, not my will be done, but your will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would um, open your hymnals with me. As we sing a, a song of thanksgiving and of response to number 591, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And if you're able, please stand, number 591. Five ninety eight.
those who are, are led by the Lord, hear his benediction as a response to you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and all of God's people said.